Hello, and welcome to our Extended Disk webinar today. Um, our topic today is interpreting Extended Disk Profile 1. Um, this is being recorded, so if you need to refresh yourself after or share it with somebody else, uh, you'll find it on our YouTube channel or on our Extended Disk website. Um, it's going to go very fast and furious, so we won't have time for questions. Feel free to put any of your questions in the questions section, and we'll follow up with you after. My name is Christina Bowser, and I am the training director here at Extended Disc. And joining me today is my guest, Mark Hugh Kalpanen, uh, president of Extended Disc. Hi, Christina. How are you? Good. Um, so the assumption today is that you are, we're talking specifically about Extended Disc profiles. Yeah, that's right. I'm glad you mentioned that because what we're going to be talking about in terms of profile one, it's specific to Extended Disc. So if you are in the audience and you're using something else, another assessment, not sure why you would, but, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's uh, it's not going to be uh, applicable to that tool. So this is specific to extended disk. Right, and you know, um, I just want to say shout out to ourselves that these um, these webinars on our um, how to interpret our disk reports have been very very well received. Um, so that's why I was asking Martiku if we could just, you know, we talk a lot about profile two, but let's just spend a little bit of time on profile one. Yeah, let's do that because I. Do you think that when we do training sessions around extended disk or when we're helping people on the phone, coaching them, maybe looking at a particular report, people often have questions about profile one because I think ultimately we want to know why we are modifying our behavior. Why are we doing these things? And I think probably more importantly, people ask, am I doing the right adjustments? So uh, let's talk about profile one. All right. So, you know, when we talk about profile one, you know, within the extended disk reports, you probably have seen them. You have two profiles that represent one individual and profile one is your perceived need to adjust. And that's what we're going to talk about today. That's right. It's really the bottom line is what profile one is. It's how the person perceives mm -hmm. they need to modify their behavior in the present environment in order to succeed. So it's specific to a point in time, specifically when they completed the questionnaire. I'm not saying that if the person completes the questionnaire next day, that there's gonna be dramatic changes in mm -hmm. profile one, but ultimately it's possible. Our natural style, our profile two, as you know, Christina, that remains stable. You mm -hmm. really do not expect <clears> that to change a whole lot, but profile one, we do expect to change as people, if they do retake the questionnaire over time. Yeah, and I like, what's that analogy you say about dating and marriage? Well, I, I found that the first, uh, when you do think about profile one, the best way for most people to relate to what we're really talking mm -hmm. about is that most of us have been on a first date or most of us have been on a job interview. Mm -hmm. And when you're in one of those situations, you really are conscious about how you are behaving, how you are acting. You're really trying to put your best foot forward. And that's really what profile one is. How do I think I need to modify my behavior in order to succeed? So like one thing with look at profile one is that's the first date. Profile two is your spouse 20 years later. Yeah, that's Not, who you wake up next to. <laughs> that's right. You know who that person truly is. Yeah. And sometimes they can be very uh, similar, but often they are different. Right. So, you know, another way that I say this, think about profile one as that snapshot. It's a picture of how you felt when you took the questionnaire and it, it's it's your more transient profile it changes as marcus says as your environment tends to change yeah not only our environment tends to change but also our perceptions of the environment mm -hmm. will change so if people person takes this questionnaire six months apart i would expect the profile one to change um, somewhat at least but typically they can actually change quite a bit profile two again remains quite stable. Right. Profile two, stable, but not rigid, we say. That's right. Um, and perception, Marku brought it up. I think that's key to understanding profile one is that it is our belief that if we made these adjustments that we would be successful. Number one doesn't automatically make us successful. Um, and I say sometimes we don't, we, there's no guarantee the person actually is going to even make those adjustments. Um, so, that's why we focus more on profile two. That is the grounded who we are. Yeah, absolutely correct. I used to have this rule that I put 90% of my focus on profile two and 10% on mm -hmm. profile one. I actually changed that over time. I'm putting now 99% of my focus on profile two, who the person really mm -hmm. is, and only 1% on profile one. So profile one is kind of nice to know, but profile two is really what you need or must know. All right, so why don't we show them what it looks like in the report? Sure. 
So here we have, go ahead. Actually, why don't you explain? You do okay. this much better than I do. <laughs> I do it all the time. So everyone, like I said, has two profile graphs. As Marku explained, um, profile one on the left is basically your adjusted style. It shows how you believe you need to adjust to meet the demands of your present environment. It always needs to be read in comparison to your natural hardwired style because that is basically your most comfortable way of doing things. I always say, think of it like a starting point. It's the base point from where we make adjustments to. Exactly. If you look at profile two and interpret that, like here we have a person who's an ID profile because those are the two styles above the middle line. You can look at profile two by itself. But mm -hmm. when you interpret profile one, it really has no meaning without making comparisons to profile two. So you always must compare it to profile two because, like you just said, profile two is a starting point. Profile one is showing us what kind of adjustments we are making from who we truly are. So we have a little bit of time here. I just want to give you a quick <clears throat> overview of how we actually interpret it. Just remember, though, for it takes training. Um, we do have some additional webinars you can um, look at on our extendedis.org website to find out more about reading it. But let me just give you an intro. So as Marku pointed out, um, anything that is above the middle line, when you look at profile two first, and I always tell people, look at profile two first, that's your starting point. Um, this person is um, in uh, I and D above the middle line. So that's their um, disc profile. They are an ID. And when you look at profile one on the left, you can see the types of adjustments this person makes. This person, the most obvious thing is this person wants to downplay their D style, correct? Absolutely. If you look at the D style, it was clearly above the middle line in profile two, and now it's clearly below the middle line in profile one. There's some other small changes, but that is the most significant change. So in practice, this really means that the person for some reason perceives that D style, that D behavior being direct, results-oriented, fast-paced, etc., is not valued on, or encouraged or motivated in their present environment. So they perceive the need to decrease that behavior because they perceive, I use that word very carefully, perceive mm -hmm. that in order for me to be successful, I need to decrease my D style. But like you said, whether they're actually doing it, we don't, we don't, know, we don't know for certain. And of course, throughout the day, we are making adjustments all around this disc model. You know, Sometimes this person even high C style because they are focused on something that requires detail orientation. But overall, this is what's happening right now. And what, how would you debrief this to an individual? What would you tell them in terms of just the downplaying of the D? Could you give that as an example? Sure. I mean, I always I'm very careful to jump into conclusions mm -hmm. because when we jump into conclusions, typically we take we basically go down the wrong path. But I usually, like in this situation, I would ask this person and say that when we see this kind of a change where a person is decreasing their D style, what it typically means that they perceive that in order for them to be successful, they cannot be as fast-paced, as decisive, as direct, um, as um, even assertive, mm -hmm. you know, using those D descriptors because they believe that they cannot succeed if they are that way. I don't suppose that resonates with you. And then I shut up. Right. So uh, what basically, you know, you heard was Marku using just um, non-judgmental descriptors, how we describe a D style. And then he ended it with almost like an open-ended question. So we're not assuming anything on that part. We're giving them the opportunity to provide more information. That's right. Because if I have built good trust with this particular mm -hmm. individual, they live this profile two and one every day. So they know what it means. Now they understand how to actually talk about those behaviors in the very well-defined and non-judgmental framework of the DISC model. That's really the, the greatest thing about the DISC model. Mm -hmm. It's not good or bad or better or worse. It's simply different. And when you help them kind of unlock the information, they will begin to talk about it. Mm -hmm. and, and if you just talk about general terms like, you know, you need to be less, you feel you need to be less direct, less fast pace, et cetera, they begin to typically share what it actually means. Exactly. So this is one visual representation of a person's disc profile, their profile one and profile two. So let us show you another way to represent a person's profile results, and that is on the extended disc diamond. Uh, that's right. And, and the way we represent it here is that the starting point of the arrow is really Essentially, it's the location of that profile, too, on the extended disk diamond. It's kind of like the coordinates where we map that, that particular profile. 
the tip of the arrow is, of course, then profile one. And that arrow will begin to show us how significant change the person perceives they need to make, again, in order to be successful in the present environment. So again, this is the same profile we saw before. It's the same person. We know that they were a dominant I, um, so therefore they're in the I quadrant. And then as Marcu said, the tip of the arrow, it's moving away from the D quadrant. They still want to focus on I, but for whatever reason, they feel the need to downplay their D. Yeah, and that's what we typically, we are very conditioned when we look at arrows to think about where we're moving to. But we also need to look at where we are moving away from. Um, at a very macro level, this person is moving away from the D style because mm -hmm. they perceive that kind of behavior is not going to create success for them. Yeah, and just a tip, I always say, look around the outer um, diamond. There's the words that will help you debrief, you know, um, the different disc quadrants. Um, so again, length of arrow, there's no set, I say there's no set length of arrow that makes it short, medium, or long, but it's our, you know, it's subjectively, you can see that this is probably not the shortest arrow, but it's not the longest arrow either, but it just represents the amount of energy that it would take for this person to make that adjustment. That's right. Longer the arrow, it make basically, I need to get out of my comfort zone. I mm -hmm. need to stretch my behavioral style more and more. In this example, the person remains in the same quadrant. They start, the starting point of the arrow is in the eye quadrant, tip of the arrow is in the eye quadrant. So it's not a significant change. And it's not uncommon to see it to go to the next quadrant, like here we could have gone to maybe D or an S quadrant, uh, not, nothing that significant. Typically when we call the opposite quadrant, in this example that would be the C quadrant, it begins to require even more energy because that essentially is the opposite behavior in many ways. Exactly. And so again, you know, a profile one, the arrow, just it helps us to visualize what types of adjustments that this particular individual wants to make. And it's, it's a, there's another powerful way to look at it that we'll save for another webinar. And that's what looking at arrows for an entire group of people. That's right, because the profiles will always provide us with the most specific information about somebody's, not only their natural style, but how they perceive, perceive they need to adjust. But when you have, a, let's say, a team of, let's say, 10 people, if you put 10 profiles of 10 individual profiles on the conference room table, it's difficult to really comprehend what's happening and understand right. what we need to do. When we put everybody's arrow on the team report, what we call the arrow map, then it becomes a very easy to interpret and we can understand what some of the underlying challenges or strengths or weaknesses we might have. Exactly. So delivering results, what do we do with profile one? Just remember, profile one is the individual's present perception. It's their belief that if they made these adjustments to their natural style, um, they would be more successful. As Marku mentioned to you, um, because it is a transient profile, because it's only their perception, um, Focus only about 1% of your energy, you said, Marku? Yeah, 99% on profile two and only 1% on profile one. I mean, the big picture is clearly the focus needs to be on profile yes. one. Again, going to back to that a dating example, let's say you have a date today and you have make those adjustments, you hope to make a good impression, but you fail. Well, next week you, you might have another date. Now you might modify your behavior again differently because you're having a date with a different person or job interview with a different company. That's really what's happening is that we are constantly changing our adjustments. Right. And ultimately, that's what we're really trying to do is that when we provide and use extended disk assessments, ultimately the end goal is to modify behavior. And if you think about profile one, that's how we need to adjust. If we are really using extended disk to the fullest um, potential, we are constantly changing profile one, making sure we are interacting with others as effectively as possible by making conscious, clear decisions how to modify our own behavior, because that is the only thing we can control. We have no control over the other person. That's a great way to summarize it, Marku. Thank you. Um, he didn't know I put this in here, but I did put oh. our logo. Our, we just were awarded the top 20 company for assessments and evaluation from the training industry. So I want to congratulate Marku and, of course, pat ourselves all on the back. Well, it's, it's really a team effort. So, yeah, we're very excited about that, you know, being a group of totally 
uh, 20 companies around the world. So um, we're very proud of it. And uh, of course, our clients really deserve exactly. the, the greatest you know? thanks for that. Now, now you guys can you guys can broadcast that you also belong to our company. Um, so we do have another webinar coming up. It's on the Sales 18 assessment. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's fascinating. It's brand new. Yeah, it's based on DISC, uh, mm -hmm. but actually if you use this with your sales professionals, your sales team, the, the practitioners or the users or the clients do not need to know anything about the DISC model, but we're still able to use the fundamentals of the DISC and we calculate what we call match percentages in 18 critical sales areas that really are important to somebody's sales success. Excellent. Coming up February 13th, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. We have a lot of other webinars we just added, so check our extendeddisc.org website under the Events tab. Great. Thank you, Christina. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Everybody.